And um, to say, actually, do we have a we have someone who can describe for us? Yes, I will describe. All right, Karen, thank you. Um, uh, we often, uh, at this point, we would have a public comment period. Um, uh, although, since if you're all here for Lily's presentation, that's on the agenda, so you don't have to speak about that then. Um, so if anybody wants to comment otherwise, no? We will, um, actually, I'm going to set aside even the approval of the minutes right now. If Lily's here, we obviously have a lot of other people. Why don't we go right to uh, a presentation by Lily Lombard on tree cover Thank and you. energy efficiency, right? Um, <laughs> well, yeah, oh, okay. I mean, I'm, I'm here because you're the, right the Energy and Sustainability Committee, but um, right. it's really about the larger question of uh, tree program in Northampton. So thank you all. Um, I know most of you, but I don't think I know you. Brian Bruce. Uh, and are you a citizen member of the committee? Or? I am. Nice yeah. to meet you. Thank you. Um, and I know the rest of you. I'm Lily Lombard. I live at 39 Monroe Street, and I thank you for inviting me to come and present today. Um, and I have with me uh, a number of citizens who are interested in this topic, many of whom couldn't come because it's 4 o'clock on a work day. Um, but I just want to point out a couple. Jay Gerard, who is an arborist and served on the Northampton Tree Committee for a number of years, um, and Gina Louise um, Ciara, our uh, Ward 4 City Council. Um, so I'm going to give a brief presentation and then I'll just open it up and I'll just say this is my first time presenting this and I'm hoping to get some feedback, refine it, maybe share it with other committees. I look forward to possibly um, presenting to the Board of Public Works because um, trees intersect so um, clearly with uh, public works. They are a public infrastructure. Um, so please also just let me know how this slideshow goes. Uh, I, I look forward to your candid feedback. Okay, so um, a society grows great when old men plant trees in whose shade they know they shall never sit. Um, those trees right there um, are great elm trees that used to, you know, line many streets in Northampton. The one on the right it was the Edwards Elm, a famous tree on King Street that was planted by Jonathan Edwards in 1750, um, eight years before he died, and lasted until it fell in 1913. Um, so trees are a very long-lasting infrastructure, and it's true, it's an act of faith to plant them and know that you probably won't enjoy them the way the next generation will. I just want to share with you that um, this is a culmination of um, almost a year of work and research, interviews, um, travel that I've done, um, including um, interviewing almost every member of the Northampton Tree Committee, past chairs, the arborists, members, um, met with uh, our um, the Department of Conservation Resources and U.S. Forest Service um, forester Molly Freilisher. I've interviewed the DPW director in Amherst and their tree warden, Alan Snow, and the chair of their tree committee because Amherst is such a great model that I'll talk about. Um, I've interviewed Wayne. Um, eight out of nine of the city councilors spoken, um, had a meeting with the mayor. Um, also um, acquire all those great archival photos, which you'll see from um, a Forbes librarian, and um, took a trip to Toronto, where they have a world-class uh, urban forestry program, and learned about, you know, the best of the best. Um, so I'm just going to get right to it. My um, conclusion from all of this that I learned is that Northampton needs a comprehensive tree program. Um, and uh, I'll explain what that means as we go throughout, but I just want to um, give this visual um, dichotomy of Bridge Street in the late 18th century, sorry, 19th century, and Bridge Street today. And um, you can just um, viscerally feel the difference of the streetscape. Um, and uh, I think that we have the possibility of getting back to a much more um, green streetscape like that. And it's, I don't think it would take that much work. Benefits of the sheep street, shade trees are many. Um, this is another dichotomy. This is King Street um, in the early 20th century. I learned that King Street was actually quite a beautiful residential street, um, mm -hmm. and King Street today, um, where you know when you stand on the corner of Main and, um, and Pleasant on a, on a sunny day, you're, you're pretty overwhelmed by the, by the blazing sun. Um, so what I thought as I would just, okay, interaction, ready, ready to be involved. Can you guys just name for me a couple of benefits you feel that tre shade trees offer? 
Yes. Reduces air, air conditioning loads. Okay. They're nice to sit under on a hot day. Awesome. <laughs> Shade. Shade. Okay. Anyone else? Entire swings to them. Entire swings to them. Kids love to climb them and swing on them. There are many ecosystems and habitats. Habitat enhancement? Breezes. Br breezes? Yes, as they come through. And mm -hmm. Okay. Um, they calm traffic. These are these are all things that have been documented, peer reviewed. They calm traffic. They actually improve mental health. Patients that um, have windows that face um, trees and greenery have a, a better outcome in um, recovery than um, uh, than hospital rooms that don't face trees. Um, they spur economic vitality. They reduce crime. Uh, they enhance use of public space. They improve air and water quality. They increase property value. That's a big one. Um, but what I'm going to focus on is with climate change, I feel like all the benefits of trees are far more compelling. And when you talk about climate change, you talk about mitigation and adaptation. For mitigation, um, trees are uh, huge stores of carbon. Um, first of all, what woody plants are 21 times more um, capable at, at sequestering carbon than non-woody or herbaceous plants. But large mature trees are the captains of carbon sequestration. A 30-inch um, diameter tree sequesters a thousand times more carbon than a four-inch tree. So it's sort of exponential there. Um, and uh, uh, trees that are located in cities are even better because they have that, the added bonus, bonus of reducing um, energy, energy needs. Um, you know, Chris mentioned air conditioning loads. Uh, I want to give the example of the city of Worcester. You know, they were, they've been recently infested by the um, Asian longhorn beetle, and they have had to, Jay knows this because he worked out there, they had to remove 28,000 trees. Um, and they have documented the um, increase in energy requirements in summertime because of those trees, and in some neighborhoods where all the trees were taken out, the energy surge was the order of 40%. Um, and, um, and, you know, the U.S. Forest Service says that um, well-positioned trees can um, decrease cooling costs by 30% and heating costs because they also buffer wind by 20 to 50%. Um, so that's why I'm really focusing on you know the urban tree. This, by the way, those trees are on Hospital Hill, and if you can imagine you know um, wind sweeping through there, they're like a sentinel blocking wind um, when, when they're in a line like that. So um, so they mitigate and they also defend against the local effects of, of global warming. Um, and that is things like heat, you know, just searing heat that we're going to experience in, in um, you know, greater frequency as um, in the coming years. Flooding, so stormwater um, runoff reduction, soil erosion, and property damage. They do all of those things. Um, this is a map that comes straight out of the National Climate Assessment, which was just published uh, about six weeks ago and came out. And it shows the Northeast region um, experiencing in the um, recent history a 71% increase in very heavy precipitation events. So this is our future. And trees are the front line to um, mitigate the effects of those kind of um, heavy events. Um, and for every, uh, again the U.S. Forest Service says that for every 5% we increase our tree canopy, we reduce our stormwater load by 2%. They soften the, um, you know, the fall of water. They actually take water into their leaves and roots, um, and uh, they help to slow down the velocity of water as it moves through our city. Um, also, what is a, um, an incredible concern for us here in the valley is our air quality. Um, you know, once again, hooray, we got a um, F grade for our air quality in, in Hampshire County. Um, and, uh, you know, a lot of it is related to heat. Um, ozone is um, activated by heat. And so as, <coughs> you know, again, as we face the, the future with um, rising heat, we're going to face higher air quality, I mean, higher um, levels of ozone. And uh, trees do a great bit to mitigate that. Let's see. Um, so trees are a long-term appreciating infrastructure. Um, picture of the Parsons elm tree back in the early part of the century because it was a little like Model T 
car there, that's how I can tell how, uh, what that, <laughs> when, that, when that photo was taken. It was a mature tree then, and look at it now. So it was probably 100 years at least old then, and this is like uh, 100 years later. And thanks to um, former arborist um, of our town, Ed Cotton, uh, a, a lot of that's a, it's an elm tree, so a lot of Dutch elm was taken out of it over the years. But there is no proactive program in our city now to protect mature trees that singularly add so much benefit to our town. I mean, you can see the the amount, the square footage of shade that that tree provides. It's an awesome specimen. You should go should take a look. Um, and most cities estimate that um, for every dollar you invest in trees, a city return is, um, gets back between three and five dollars in public services. So uh, what does an intelligent and comprehensive municipal tree program look like? I went to Toronto to find out. I've done a lot of interviewing in Amherst. Uh, and these are, the, these are the basics that I, I was able to conclude. Um, it is guided by a, a permanent expert professional, a tree warden in our state, because our state actually uh, requires tree wardens for every municipality. Um, it's Mass General Law 41 that requires every municipality to have a tree warden. And in towns of 10,000, population 10,000 and above, it requires someone who has professional experience. Um, performs a baseline tree inventory. In order to know what you, where you need to go with your tree program, you have to know what you have. It develops an urban forestry plan. So it, um, and a plan, as you know, you guys, we've gone through many planning processes in this town. Sustainable Northampton plan, the bike ped plan. Um, it involves lots of different players who all say, hey, this is, these are my constraints, these are my needs, and then you get full community buy-in. And an urban forestry plan would do a lot of the same. Um, it leverages resources, tons of volunteers, um, and also grants that are out there to help cities regreen. And it's supported by a healthy budget. It's hard to do anything on no budget. Um, and so it has to become a priority in the city. All right, Northampton's tree program over the past 10 years. Let me just qualify this by saying that this is not a point your finger sort of, you know, um, this person is to blame, this body is to blame. We do the best with the resources we have. And um, in 2003, when we <coughs> established a Northampton Tree Committee to serve as a tree warden, um, we did it with the best of intentions and with the hope of a positive outcome. And um, my research, unfortunately, leads me to the conclusion that, that was, it was not a positive outcome. It was an experiment, but it was unfortunately a failed experiment. It's uh, very rare. In fact, the city of Northampton is only one of two in the Commonwealth to have a tree committee act as the tree warden, and it's very problematic. One of the things it was able to do was able to improve zoning requirements for trees. Um, and so when you see new developments happen, you do see trees planted in those new developments along King Street, along new housing developments. But these are the things that weren't able to be accomplished. No tree inventory. This is in the 10 years that we had the tree committee. No tree management plan. Um, lots of accounts of a frustrated public and a demoralized committee. A declining tree canopy. And that's, um, that's the uh, chart to the right where you see from 2006 to 2013, a net negative uh, every year for trees, um, with the average of us losing 31 trees per year. And remember, that's not one for one, like inches for inches. That's like probably a mature 30-inch maple tree replaced by a, a new two-inch sapling. Uh, and then, because we're not guided by an inventory or a plan, um, it's a reactive model of, of planting care and monitoring as, as opposed to a proactive one. Um, so trees, unfortunately, are sometimes put in the wrong place. Um, there's, there's, um, there's just not the forethought that there needs to be in, in, in the planting of trees. And, and that goes for care, the care as well. And then right now, where we stand is that there is an, basically no, no committee. Um, it, it is down to three members. It's not meeting. It's not, it's not functioning. So that's where we are in, in Northampton. Um, Aiden asked me to pull out the uh, Sustainable Northampton Plan to see how it references trees. Um, and it does a little bit, but it's all pretty pretty lukewarm. And when the, the plan was updated a few year, years ago, right, Wayne? Yeah, it's the original plan, 2006. 2006, it hasn't been updated? Oh, okay, all right. So um, 
I, I wasn't sure about that. I thought I remember things going out for. We started okay. discussion. Right? Okay, all right. Uh, so here's what it says. The land use goal, minimize the loss of tree canopy throughout the city and increase tree canopy in urbanized areas to maintain a higher quality environment in all areas. Add standards in city tr street tree and open space programs to help reduce fossil fuel use. Um, one of the metrics was measuring the size of the canopy over time. I, I don't know if that's been done. Um, and also shooting for a one-to-one -one replacement of trees and a goal of 25, at least 25 more trees added per year. Uh, all right, so I'm going to switch now to say, so we know that Northampton struggled, and so did, Nor did Amherst, the town of Amherst, for many, many years. But it's in a really much better place now. Um, it you know, has installed a professional tree warden. It has begun planting uh, 2,000 trees. And I just want to talk a little bit about how they got there. Um, okay, so like I said, Amherst was, was where we were about um, seven years ago. Decades of tree neglect, without a tree warden, canopy in decline, a lot of their mature street trees just dying out. So a grassroots um, effort was o underway to educate the public and also lobby public officials, public committees like I'm doing to you now. And they were able to install a volunteer tree warden who happened to have been very experienced. He was working for the, um, he was the state urban forester at the time, uh, Alan Snow. And, uh, and he was able to um, get a tree inventory started. Um, he wrote a grant. It's all this, these kinds of things are all grant fundable. And, um, and once they really got the ball rolling, uh, th there, there came to be city buy-in. He started working with the Department of Public Works um, he started meeting with the town manager, and at, at some point, like a switch just went on. And the town manager bought in, the head of the DPW bought in, and um, they decided to create a full-time position in their Department of Public Works um, with the title of Director of Trees and Grounds. And Alan says he spends about two-thirds of his time on trees, and then he also is you know, superintendent of other parks and cemeteries. Um, and that happened in 2011. They, they then did a phase two of their tree inventory, and then in 2012, um, they bonded $612,000 to plant 2,000 trees over two year, three years. So um, that's the, I find it an exciting model. I think that they decided that um, trees were a priority, and I'm coming to you with the thesis that trees are important um, as a uh, a way of preparing us for climate change, but that's not the argument that compelled the citizens of Amherst. Three years ago, or four years ago, actually climate change was not on the radar that it is now. So w they, s they actually won people over on just the argument of quality of life. It enhances our everyday quality of life. Um, so that might be the message that we bring to you know other groups that we attend to, but here today I'm, I'm I feel that the message I want to communicate is that trees are an important um, way of us adapting to and mitigating climate change. Um, there is a citizen effort underway now to really um, revitalize trees as, a, as an important component of our, our city. And this, uh, about a month ago, we got together and were trained by uh, a U.S. forester in how to use iTree. And iTree is a free um, software developed by the U.S. Forest Service for um, inventorying trees and then quantifying the benefits of that inventory. So it gives you a dollar value for those, for those trees. To ha it, so it's an advocacy tool for persuading groups like you and our city council and our mayor that trees are a worthwhile investment. So we got, th we've got that underway. Ned, I would love you know, to know if the DPW is interested in um, helping us shape that uh, iTree inventory, what sort of um, information we should be capturing that's useful to you all. This is uh, this is very much a um, an effort of collaboration. Absolutely. Great. Um, so I'm going to just conclude with um, this: trees are the only public infrastructure that exists that appreciates in value over time, and that value will be utterly evident in 20 years with rising temperatures and tempests. With that future in mind, the Chinese proverb has never been truer. The best time to plant a tree was 20 years ago. Mm -hmm. The second best time is now. Mm -hmm. um, this is another great picture of uh, Bridge Street. Um, 
And I'm just saying Northampton, we're a five-star sustainable community. We should be investing in a comprehensive chief program. How do we get there? Thank you very much. Questions? Yeah. Can, uh, will your presentation be available to members of the commission and other members? I, I'm Are happy to. Sure, I can forward it to you. Or, or a website link or something. Uh -huh. And I also wanted to just share some resources that I have, um, I have found really helpful and I've shared with the mayor. Um, I'm sure you're familiar with the organization ICLEI. Um, it's the local governments for sustainability organization. We're a member of ICLEI. And uh, they put out a, um, a basically a toolkit for local government and <coughs> urban forestry. And I think this is really powerful. It's got a lot of um, data on the connection between climate mitigation and trees. I also love this book, Walkable City. Um, it is a chapter on trees. And this guy says, you know, of all the features of a city that I would pinpoint as most conducive to a walkable city would probably be trees. And then this one, Planning the Urban Forest. This is, a, this is the APA, American Planning Association, put this out. I'm actually just starting to read this, but there are some, those are some references I'm using. Any other questions? Billy, about six years ago at Smith Oak Tech, they gave away somewhere between 1,200 and 2,000 trees to different people in town. I mean, you basically had to apply for a tree, I think it was. And I did and got one and we planted it and it's thriving. But I'm wondering, has that effort stopped? Is it, or is did that you still say going? how many years ago? About six, five or six. Yeah, we got two trees. We got a tree. We, we were a little bit late because we heard it was all like yeah. Yeah. kind of word of mouth. We it got was, one yeah. beautiful one. That, that was the National Grid Grant. So that, yeah, was, yeah. That, was, that was a grant that the, the tree committee secured. Okay. Um, I think it was more in the order of 50 to 100 trees. Oh, it was? Wasn't I thought it was a lot more than that. It wasn't. I don't remember the number. I thought yeah. it was a twenty-five thousand dollar grant that the tree committee received from national. It was ten. Yeah, I think it was ten thousand for between fifty and hundred trees. Okay. Yeah, I remember I got several too. Yeah, um, and you know what? The funny thing about that is one of the trees that I got was uh, a, a hybrid American elm that is supposed to be Dutch elm disease resistant, and I just cut Dutch elm blight out of it today. Oh. Yeah. This is this is Dutch elm season. If you look at all those mature sh um, elm trees and look for signs of uh, blight because this is the time to catch it. Now, is that money still available? I mean, that kind um, of money? You know, it, it, so it's, a, uh, it's something you have to apply for. The, basically, that was the last grant the tree committee ever applied for. Mm -hmm. It was, uh, I think it was a hard grant to implement. Oh. Uh, there were some challenges there, and so there haven't been any since. But there are opportunities like that to do come around. Okay. Absolutely. Do you have a sense of how having a proper management plan and a full-time staff person alleviates future higher expenses. So overall, it's actually a smart investment, or is it, to have someone full-time dedicated to this? You know, well, I mean, I, I use Chris as a parallel. I mean, we look at what the, um, the city of Northampton was able to achieve in its energy goals before Chris came on board, and then what he was able to achieve after. I mean, he's always applying for grants. He's leveraging community resources all the time. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, it's a leveraging tool. And um, and that's what it very much. And the other thing is, in um, you know, in Northampton, it costs it costs an average of seven hundred dollars to plant a tree. Wow. And in um, Amherst, because they're working with an economy of scale and they're working with a professional who has connections, they've got it down to three hundred dollars a tree. Mm -hmm. So that's savings there too. I just mean specifically in terms of managing the canopy, like managing the existing trees and not waiting until it's an emergency right. or they're so right. large, but actually maintaining them. Yeah. You know, it's, you know, Ned, Ned can speak to the challenges of that. It's huge. I'm sure it's, it it's, it's a huge staff commitment. But, you know, what I think, I think we realize is um, I, we have a very large shade tree uh, that's actually on the public way, but we manage, we maintain it near our house. And it would look like it was in great decline. And so we invested the $1,000 to have it pruned, cabled, and fertilized. And it's amazing that tree has got a new life. <coughs> I mean, John, yeah. it's, 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 it's like it's a new tree. And so it, it's a good investment. That tree is our carbon sink. It's the shade to our house. It's, um, you know, it's mitigating stormwater. So yes, the upfront investment can feel 
awesome, and it's a question of how the city decides to allocate its priorities. But I guess I'm making the argument that it's a good, it's a good investment and it's a good allocation of resources. What are some of the challenges the city faces in maintaining the trees now? Um, staff predominantly. Mm -hmm. We have a, well, not a full-time tree crew, but pretty much so. And the only time we go out with the trees is the citizen requests if they're damaged or they have an issue with them. Mm -hmm. and we do an inspection, we ensure that they're a public shade tree or not. Uh, we have an arborist on board, um, on staff, who will inspect the tree and make recommendations for it. And then the crew goes out and, you know, implements those recommendations. Is that separate from the electric uh, line right away? It is separate. The National Grid has their own tree trimming program also they're coming with, besides what we do. And that's another benefit of having a full-time tree warden, is that I know that in, in Amherst, and, and you may do that here, so, so you can correct me if, uh, if that's not the case, but when they find out when the electric company is coming, and, and he is there waiting for them to make sure that they're using the right techniques. Um, and and if, if you know and, and she's just un in front of it, so that there is an improper pruning that can take down eventually uh, that can greatly reduce the life of the tree. So if a shade tree disappeared and all of a sudden electric bills go up forty percent, <laughs> should we approach the National Grid and see if they can get incentives? Uh, I know that absolutely. in Worcester. I mean, you know, know, if you can avoid a jump in electricity use, and there, and that would do it. Yeah, and so I think it's a big, you know, not to crack, but I, yeah. I think if there's one thing, one message that I'm trying to get through here is that we need a tree warden, a proper, yeah. permanent staff tree warden, to be able to, to to do all these things, take advantage of those kinds of uh, opportunities. To, to be, you know, front and center early on the ground when there are projects that intersect with trees. Um, and, you know, speaking to the head of the DPW and, the, and the, um, the tree warden over in Amherst, what they both shared was that, you know, while, while Alan served as a volunteer tree warden, there was a little bit of a tug of war um, because he really wasn't part on the inside. But once he became part of the staff, um, all of that just sort of melted away and they all just got used to him being, you know, in all of the important uh, conversations that intersected with trees. Any further questions? Yeah. I do want to say that um, I've got three emails here, which I, which I think I'll, I'll, I'll just forward to the commission so you can read them. But all three of them have been supportive of Lily and Lily's ideas. Chris, you also have some questions. Yes, and I, I was going to get yeah, thank you very much. Great. And questions? I was going to, uh, to say, uh, you may take a look at a uh, campaign, that, uh, a tree campaign called the Tree for Trenton, happened in Trenton, New Jersey, where it was a comprehensive effort that uh, a nonprofit organization doing urban agriculture in the city, uh, city government, and the high school, and the high school environmental science slash biology teacher uh, developed an entire curriculum around trees, uh, included the engineering department of the high school, uh, so the GIS folks were involved. The students then downloaded apps onto their cell phones. Every student you know, has a cell phone these days. They would go back to their neighborhoods um, and GIS uh, you know, each of the trees, they inventory the trees, that then became part of the plan. Uh, then the school set aside an acre of land, plenty of extra space. Uh, they got donations from National Arbor Foundation as well as local nurseries. They ended up with uh, over 250 trees in their tree nursery, tree trees that were then uh, students. There's all kinds of uh, the biology classes that go out there learning about uh, mm -hmm. all kinds mm -hmm. of uh, biology concepts. They learn grafting, things of that sort. They work with a uh, volunteer from uh, local watershed nature center uh, to help with the, with the nursery and then those trees were then given to the city and, and funded with student labor, uh, church labor, things of that sort of real grassroots, very low budget, uh, and basically everything we're doing is an amazing example of you know, maintenance, you know, there was training, you know, basically if a tree got planted in front of your home or you're on your block, they would and yep. train them, yep. whether that was sustainable over time. Mm -hmm. Well, you know, the first couple of years of the tree's life are the critical years, so sometimes that can be all it takes. Yep. So, 
So it was great to be down for yeah. Well, thanks for sharing that. Just in tandem with, with his description, it, it occurs to me of the number of colleges in the college departments that we must have in beyond five colleges and beyond in the in the botany and 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 botany related areas in at a college level to get the college students also involved much the same way as he was describing at, at a slightly lower level. But, and, and I, my, my question was going to be uh, what has been the history of, uh, what, what have been some of the spots where it has worked well and why, and what, and, and what are the reasons why there hasn't been more public involvement in in this whole subject in the last 10, 15 years, if the, the PR campaign is effective enough out to the public and the educative element is effective enough to the public, it seems as, as if it's a natural that you get a strong public reaction with a highly educated populace here, for the most part, with environmental stuff. So the, co the two components that you've talked about, one is the the challenge of, of finding the money and how to find the money and then combining that with how to get volunteer and paid and or paid expertise to take that development that has been generated by the money, whether it's a nursery or, and take it to the next step for mature tree maintenance and planting and plant, planting of the young tree maintenance so it all begins to work. What, what has been, what would you say, anybody, I'll just open it up, ha, has been the crux of the failure within the city in not being able to kind of put those pieces together in the last 10 or 15 years in an, in an effective way? I mean, what, what has been the reason for the failure? And I'm, I'm trying to think of the mistakes we may have made that we can now improve on in terms of public education and PR and, and promotion of the idea. Huh? I don't know if there were a lot of mistakes made, but this is just my perception of this. I've been in city council now for 11 years. I think there was a lot of hope that the tree committee, there was this enthusiasm to begin with, that this was the way we were going to try. And I think things take time. So we're at that point now. I think we've hit that point. And look, I really thank Lily for bringing this up. It might have happened without her, but it might have been five more years. So she's the one who's kind of making, she's been making the calls, and I know that she's called or spoken to eight of the nine counselors, and all of us go, yeah, we're enthusiastic about this. So we're tapping into the energy that, that's there now. Um, back when the tree committee first started, I went to a couple of their meetings. I think they were active. I think it's been a problem on budgeting. And I agree with Lily. I think things like climate change, have, although we've certainly known about it for a long time, I think it's really moved to the fore. I think in addition, Certainly in my view, we have a lot of these old trees that are all, my street, for example, on Massasoit Street, all at once we're losing all of these pine, uh, these uh, maples. And so as that's happening, as the canopy gets older and older, it's suddenly, oh yeah, we lost one about 15 years ago, and then suddenly it's three another, and then, and so people are also recognizing that this is happening. So I, I don't think it's like any fault on anyone, I think Lily is kind of, helping us to move forward and what a lot of people, as soon as she's tapped into this, I think there's a lot of energy there now. I want to add in with, um, <coughs> you used me in my, my position as an example. And I also sit on a volunteer committee, energy committee in the town I live in, Montague. Um, and from that experience, I can say that to move an issue forward, to have a volunteer committee uh, to work with and a staff person is a really mm. good combination. But without one or the other, um, things get harder. So it's, it's, uh, it's much harder to sustain without one or the other. So I don't know if that means hiring a new position or if a committee could be rejuvenated, working with someone who's already working with the DPW. But just put that out there, and I heard you saying that one of the things you're aiming for is a tree warden. Yeah, and actually, um, the, so the, city, uh, the Department of Conservation Resources has a grant opportunity where a city of our size could apply for up to $30,000 to um, seed fund a tree warden. Um, so it would only be the first year, but you know, maybe that person would then prove their value and it would be something that the city goes, this is, this is a priority. So I just want to put it out there that we would also be willing to help write that grant. 
And I will say that I don't know the same is true with trees, but at the moment in Massachusetts, there are so many opportunities coming down state and federal level for energy efficiency, renewable energy, that for a city or town not to have someone in position who has their hand out there grabbing these things. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It's just, yeah, you know, you're, you're, you're missing an opportunity. You are, yeah. it's true. Yeah. yeah, and actually, um, you know, we just announced in April that the um, Patrick administration has decided to allocate $5 million to three cities for green. Holyoke is one of them. Um, so Holyoke is sharing a $5 million pot for tree planting among um, three, Chelsea, uh, Fort River, and Holyoke. Um, and it's all related to climate change. It's, it's their effort to reduce the greenhouse gas concentrations and meet their target. Um, so that's exciting. It's another neighbor who's really getting on board. And of course, Springfield got on board because the, the tornado wiped out thousands of trees. And they got a lot of um, federal and, I don't know about state, but I know they got federal money for it. So. Is there uh, someone that you or the committee has identified as someone they want to put forward to recommend as a tree warden? You know, I want that to go out as an open, pro open um, application process. I, I'm, a, I'm a big fan of putting out a, you know, a RFP and then judging the, the pool of candidates that come forward. I, I guess I, I, I guess I was wondering, is there a, a volunteer like Mr. Snow in Amherst that um, that is on? I think that I think that we could have. I think that I could identify an, a, an interim volunteer, because the fr the matter is we don't have a tree warden now, and we sort of need one. I mean, you know, the tree warden uh, fulfills some important immediate functions too, aside from the planning and the inventory. So, I am trying to, you know wiggle the, the, the mayor's ear about that topic. But um, but I don't know about like a permanent position. No. I, I don't I don't believe I don't know anyone particularly. Just uh, particularly from this committee, what are you looking for from this committee, either now or down the road? Are you gonna come are we gonna develop somebody come back and ask whether this committee would endorse it or Yeah. I mean I think that, that would be a really helpful thing in the way that I was I'm just realizing I was in front of you guys almost exactly a year ago mm -hmm. for your endorsement for the um, divestment campaign fossil fuels and that's not something that is like front and center to your mission but you listened and you provided your endorsement so I think that that would be terribly helpful so what we might need I don't know if other members we might need something more at a later time to come back with what is the proposal so that there's a, I think there's a wonderful um, presentation that's great, I think people should see it, but I think we're gonna have to have something yeah. that we say, okay, let's work on that, and what are we actually voting on and endorsing, kind of like we did when it was very clear on the domestic. Yeah, it was, a, it was a resolution before. I don't know yeah. if, if, if it's appropriate to put that in a resolution. Yeah, I'm not sure, so maybe we so can discuss that. Yeah, maybe you and I will have a conversation. Okay. Every once in a while I'll drive around and I'll see these signs where it says Tree City. And I'm wondering, is there something that we, are we a tree city now? We were for a number no. of years. I think this last year we did not get that designation. Is there a benefit of us having it? I mean, can we work towards getting it back? Or? Oh yeah, we can oh, yeah. work on getting it back. It, it's, it's, it's a form to fill out. Yeah, and now it's, the designation's helpful for grants, for okay. grant applications. Okay. Thank you all for listening. And, Thank you. Um, Thank you. And I appreciate everyone else for coming too. Thanks, Lloyd. You're welcome. Okay. Um, I welcome a motion to approve the minutes of uh, the 580 uh, meeting. Uh, so moved. Uh, any discussion? All in favor? Okay. Great. Right, so, um, next item, uh, a couple of status reports. Actually, a number of these next agenda items are all going to kind of lump together. Uh, I've got them there as separate pieces, but they're, they're going to kind of all lump together. Um, uh, the Community Energy Strategies Implementation Grant Opportunity. I believe we spoke about this last time and wanted to uh, just fill, you, fill everybody in on where, where, we, where we're at. 
Um, it's been sent in, and as the commission was interested in uh, the two topics that kind of rose to the top of my list as well, what we've applied for is doing an analysis of putting uh, uh, PV arrays on city-owned parking lots, and we're going to add in a couple of the emergency facilities um, for reasons that because we can't get that funded otherwise. We're not going to do an in-depth study, but we're going to be doing a um, uh, kind of a, uh, uh, what do you call it, a, a fatal flaw analysis. A little more than that because we're also going to identify um, uh, likely uh, spots and likely sizes of the arrays. Uh, where is there going to be any connection, any problem with interconnection? Is there going to be any problem with snow removal? Is there going to be um, uh, you know, an issue with shading? So basically, we're going to find out which parking lots and a couple of the emergency facilities, what would be appropriate and kind of roughly the size of the PV array that could go in there. That would then be used if we, or when we go out for an RFP for a PV on the landfill uh, to include these in that as a big package. Um, very nicely, uh, thought it was going to cost a bit more, but we got it. Uh, I have a uh, quote from someone from, uh, for under $10,000. Uh, and um, <laughs> that's okay. I think he actually kept it there so he wouldn't have to go through any more procurement. And, uh, and he, I really trust this. He's a, he's a really good engineer on the whole He helped us with the Smith Vogue Array. Uh, and so, assuming we get the money, that'll be something we can move forward on. Um, and then the second one that uh, was of high interest was outreach and education and mobilization for energy efficiency and in the community. Um, Aiden, it goes right with what you're trying to form uh, a, a group here to get started. Uh, and this would uh, provide us with money to hire an outside consultant and that's really the way this grant application is, is written. They want us to hire an outside consultant. That's what they want to spend the money on. So, um, so we wrote it for that. <laughs> Uh, the, the way I have pictured it and the way I've written it is that once we get the once we get the um, uh, approval of this, uh, the first thing I want to do is start. I want to form a steering committee and advisory committee that will follow the process all the way through and possibly follow it into a pilot test of whatever we come up with, and let that advisory committee help us. Um, uh, define who we should hire to do this. So, you know, it wouldn't be our call and, and this it wouldn't be my call on who we would hire, but we would do it as a, as a group effort. And I, I really saw Aiden's proposal from the Energy Commission mm -hmm. as being, you know, the cutting, the very tip of that, that piece. Mm -hmm. um, uh, and that kind of leads to one of the agenda items we have, Community Efficiency Working Group, uh, which we'll get to later on. So I just want to mention that right now. Um, that's one of the reasons why I asked that for the agenda again now. Um, and uh, I will also add in, and I would, I would be happy to share this proposal with anybody. Um, uh, it is kind of th thought out on how we would move forward. It's, it's really kind of beginning, at least as a straw man, uh, how to move this forward. You know, the committee could certainly the advisory committee could take it apart and put it back together again some other way. But uh, as a starting point, it's, some, it's somewhere we can go with, I think. And um, uh, nicely, there has been a large pilot program being run by the Department of Energy Resources with federal funding in Springfield and seven other communities in Massachusetts uh, for the last couple of years uh, on trying to get deeper uh, energy savings and more people involved um, and that has finished and has been evaluated and a big thick evaluation report came out um, and some of the ideas that I have, I have uh, and I believe Aiden and some others have where, where this really has to come from a, a grassroots effort up it has to have strong local support strong local identification to the program uh, strong local use of contractors, um, those kind of things. That report identified all of those things as key features, and yet it didn't try to do any of those, uh, per se. So this would almost be adding on to what they've done. Um, 
Uh, I have yet to hear how the utilities feel that went. But this was a Department of Energy Resources program. It wasn't a utility program. Um, uh, um, and also very nicely, they had this nice little uh, flow chart on how the Mass Safe program works. And I was able to kind of put together a flow chart on how we could possibly run a local program that would be in parallel to the Mass Safe program, separate from it, not controlled by the Mass Safe program, but running in parallel with it, that would tie into it and, and, and pull the resources from the Mass program in as it can. And that's kind of the vision, that's the vision that I see going forward, is that this becomes, and the way I picture this, it may be a one-year pilot program, but it really should lead into a decades-long effort because there's so much to be done this can't be done in one year, a couple of years. This has to be a sustained effort on, ongoing. And that, that's what I'd hope, and that's what I wrote in the proposal, that um, whether it is through Green Communities Grants, which they're starting to provide funding to help outreach uh, um, for some communities, whether it's our revolving fund, whether it's local fundraising and volunteers, that ultimately we aim for a sustained local program. That ties in and taps our local resources and our local contractors and stuff like that, and really pushes it. So that's that's kind of the vision that I have, uh, and that's what we proposed. Uh, Funding-wise, we were able to put in for twenty-five thousand uh, dollars. So I did. That would leave fifteen thousand dollars for this effort. I, my gut instinct and in looking at the number of hours, my gut instinct says that it may be up. It may be more than that, and so. That actually will get up to one of the next items on. I'm going to come back to that because I'm going to actually ask for some funds. I'm going to ask the commission to appropriate some funds from the energy, the revolving fund. Um, uh, when I do ask that, as I'll bring it up at that point, uh, I've already gone over this with the mayor, and the mayor's in support of this and is in support of using the money uh, for that. Question. Yeah. Before we go further. So is yeah. the, what you wrote. Um, for the grant is, is to hire an outside consultant to support, is that separate from this this proposal that uh, including a program design or is that the same thing? That yeah, an outside consultant would help us come up with a program design. Okay. Yeah. They would help us identify metrics, uh, so age of houses, what level of efficiency improvements have been done already, where can we expect to have certain um, uh, barriers, uh, you know, moist soil or whatever, um, income levels, uh, and this is this is now going beyond anything I've ever seen anybody else do. Income levels, how people network in the community, where do they socialize, how do they get their information. Um, we really take advantage of our neighborhood groups, take advantage of our churches, our, our faith organizations, our civic organizations, you know, how do people connect in there, and, and try to use that kind of a map to identify where we have our best shot and where it's going to be hard um, and then have an evaluation and measurement plan that goes along with that. So not only do we measure what we're exceeding at, but we measure at what we're missing. Um, so we can continue over the years to go back and say, we're not getting to this group. Why? Uh, let's find out how we get there. That gets, that's a lot of the data analysis that was referenced yes. in the, the grant uh, in this Yes, right. But in terms of the program design implementation, that's up to the, the community, up to us. That, they would help us. They would help us with that. Mm -hmm. um, that's that's the way I'm picturing it. But it's going to depend on who we find to hire, uh, whether they have expertise in that or not. I have a feeling some of them will have an expertise from an, from an outside-in point of view, mm -hmm. and I think it's going to be really important that the city provide the inside to ourselves, the inside to inside point of view, and, and make sure that part of the mm -hmm. Um, the effort gets gets into there, so I see it. I see the consultant ideally as being someone that we work with, not someone that does it for us, but that, that we work with. Yeah, because after that twenty-five thousand or whatever is gone in right. nine months, then you know, for continuous, it has to be driven from within. Right, and at that point, I would I would try to get a, a pilot program funded. Yeah. Is my is my first question. Try it for one year someplace. At least get funding for that. And then from there, try to establish long-term funding. So that's the that's the vision that I put out, and I'm and that will give us an opportunity to take a huge amount of ideas that came out of the forums and try to work them in and actually implement them into a strategic uh, plan. Any other questions? 
Wait, that's why you just sit forward all of a sudden. Right? <laughs> just change your position. Okay. I'd love to read what you wrote. And, um, sure. I, I love the concept of, of thinking uh, implementation as well as design in the beginning. Not just say it's been a consultant to tell us about our community. And then later at some point, maybe we'll figure out implementation. Or if we're going to get something done, if we're going to save energy, we need to understand how we're going to have a program and leverage funding and, and you know, do this in grassroots too. Right. So okay. I like that a lot. Yeah. Yeah, that was the idea behind behind the, the community working group that I thought of a couple months ago. It's like, let's think of a program, let's get some traction. Even if it's one small thing or one effort, let's do something. Right. So this actually provides some resources to to make that a little bit more real. Yeah. Right. right. Um, as an aside, uh, uh, FERCOG is also putting in for a community strategies program, and one of the two things that they're applying for. Um, isn't basically an outreach and mobilization plan for landlords and tenants. And um, PDPC might be doing that as well. It's the one that they're considering. So it's not just Northampton, there's other places that are, uh, that are very interested in trying to do some kind of a direct <coughs> outreach on energy efficiency. Um, any other questions? It's a status report we have. So we should hear June 20th, actually, we say. So then we'll come up quick we'll we hear whether we got it. Um, the, resilience, the, the Clean Energy Resiliency Initiative grant opportunity. I'll fill you in on this one. Uh, it's um, kind of been a convoluted changing targets. The targets have been shifting. Uh, <coughs> but here's where it stands at the moment. And, and let me know if I've already gone over this because I can't remember what I did the last time we, we met. Um, so there, there's two things you can apply for. You can either apply for technical assistance or you can apply for prob uh, program implementation. Uh, uh, so you can actually get funds to put something in or you can apply for technical assistance. Um, half their $40 million is going to go for program implementation in phase one. Half of it's going to go for phase two program implementation. In order to get that money out of that phase two, you have to be going through their technical assistance program. So if I, even if we hired an outside engineer to engineer it to whatever level we wanted to, if we're not going through their technical systems, we cannot apply to the phase two. So um, uh, in short, I've concluded that we are not ready to apply for any implementation um, uh, right now. Uh, we really wanted to. And so talking with the mayor uh, who, uh, uh, he would like to use many money from the Energy Commission, from the revolving fund, to pay a consultant to an uh, engineer to look at at least one facility to identify whether or not um, a, a PV array can be put on there and integrated as a part of the backup system. Um, because of the time pressure, uh, we actually went ahead and did that, even though the commission hasn't been asked whether they want to pay for this. <laughs> if that's the case, I guess if you guys turn us down, I guess the city will have to scramble. Right. <laughs> Here goes my salary. <laughs> um, and uh, to make things even worse, we've had the initial walk through the, the facility we identified was a fire department. It's got that beautiful south southwest facing roof, yeah. beautifully sloped metal roof. Thought it would be ideal. It's a copper roof. Oh. It won't. I didn't know it was copper. It won't hold a PV array. Yeah. Yeah. It's a copper roof. There, it, the consultant so far has identified where a smaller array could go on the site. It would have to be basically mounted up on a, um, uh, not over the parking lot. The parking lot's not really configured right for it. It would have to sit on the south side of the building. It would be about half the size. And he also says that the type of generator that we have there doesn't play well with the PV array. <laughs> So at the moment, that means we've hired somebody to give us. What's that? Come on up to DPW land. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Stop for you. okay. <laughs> well, the, that's one reason that, that that's one reason I put out that email to meet with you and Jim, because I want to talk with you about possible, uh, you know, where do we do with resiliency? How are we moving forward on some of the non-renewable aspects of of that plan, just to make sure things are moving forward, and also identify. What, what facilities could we possibly apply for this? And I'm going to see if we can then 
ask him to take some of his time and effort. Already, but he knows right now, he's not going to take it to the degree that we asked for at the beginning. We basically asked for him to provide us with all the documentation we would need to apply for this, um, uh, and it was a lot. They were asking for a lot of detailed stuff to apply. He's not going to give us that. I did ask him to at least bring it to the point where I know what size of an array we can get there and about how much it would cost, so that you know we're not we didn't waste all his time and our the little bit we spent. Because getting there means at the fire station. At the fire station, even if it's the smaller one, that's where it's right. And what that would be, it wouldn't it would not be used for an emergency situation, but it would, again we could possibly work that into an array at the landfill, a big PV array. So it could be along with the parking lots. You know, we could possibly put one on some other city uh, facilities. Um, it would, you know, drive down the energy use on energy, utility energy use at the site. Um, uh, but it's, it wouldn't be used for an emergency situation. It, largely because it doesn't play with a generator well. And he saw that site as being fairly robust for resiliency already. I mean, we could put in, I think the one thing we need to do is add an extra tank and we really would like to add a mobile generator pool and the pit and sleeve so that we can do a backup generator there. Um, if we did that, that site's pretty pretty solid and there's not really a reason to add. He, he thinks that if we applied for it, we wouldn't get the funding. He's looked at the application and he just doesn't think we would get it for that site. For, um, the, for the fire station. For the fire station, right. So, could we for a different site? And that's one thing I do want to talk to Ned and, and as soon as I talk to Ned, we're going to go back to our consultant, like this guy that we've you know, take it on at the moment um, for just a little under $10,000. Um, uh, <laughs> and if he can then at least do an initial uh, study of some other site. I'm not sure if he could. I, I think we're not going to be ready to apply for implementation funds no matter what. I just don't think we are. I'm going to be surprised to find, a, to see how many communities um, uh, are ready for that. I think it's going to be it's going to be hard pressed for many, many communities to, uh, to get ready for that. Um, the technical analysis piece, we are focusing, we are putting in for that. And uh, this grant will pay, it has a formula for how much any one community can apply for uh, based on population and income. And our formula says that we can apply for up to $530,000. Um, there's one exception to that. And that one exception is if there's a, a viable microgrid that is considered complex and crossing a public way would make it complex, they're willing to look uh, and consider going up to $5 million mm -hmm. to support something like that. So <laughs> we actually, and the example they give in their workshops and uh, their, their, their PowerPoints and stuff is a hospital that has a combined heat and power system next to uh, a high school that's used as a community shelter um, that has a solar array. That is the example they use. That sounds like a five-star situation. So, so with that, we need to be on your front street. That's great. So, 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 Great. So with that, with the I, I, am, I am putting in for, for a technical analysis of tying the DPW, Smith Boat, and the hospital together in a microgrid, possibly adding combined heat and power to Smith Boat, possibly adding a PV array to the DPW. That's another one I'll, I'll be talking with you and Chip about to see whether that's even out. You know, or I might just pull that out. Um, uh, and I'm putting it in as, as a um, you know basically an either or. I'm not saying this is what we want. I'm saying these are the things we're looking at. We want to go through the technical analysis to find out what's feasible and then get the uh, technical details that we need to apply for the phase two of the grant. Um, so that's what we're going for. Um, and, well, I don't know. We'll see. We'll see what we get. It sounds like a natural. It sounds like what? A natural. It does. And, you know, it's, it's interesting. It was one of the first things I identified when I came, when I started working here. And I looked at Smith Boat. And I knew they needed a new boiler. Um, uh, is, we actually talked to the Con Ed about it, Con Edison about it during the performance contract. And I looked at that and I said, the DPW, uh, Smith Voke, um, whether it's a electric grid or, or distributed heat, 
that's just, it seemed like to me, it just fit. It just seemed from the very beginning like that's, that it, it's asking for it. Mm -hmm. So it's an opportunity to see whether or not it actually flies. Mm -hmm. I am finding out that PV arrays being used as backup systems are definitely more complicated than I do. Um, there's, uh, they're just, it's not necessarily an easy plug and play. It's almost like it should be, they should really be put together and designed as one system. Smith Oak and DPW both. Um, there are functions at both facilities that it's okay to leave off if we have a two day outage. If we had a 10 to 20 day outage, there's fun functions that we would want to have on behind the generator that are not currently behind the generator. Um, full kitchen load is not on, is not behind our generator at Smith Oak. Um, air conditioning is not. Um, the welder and the air compressor are not behind uh, the the current generator of the DPW, and only a very small piece of the admin building is. So if you're talking about a long power outage where you really need to support a lot of the community, you really want that. So that actually asks the question, do we need new generators there? And if we do, do we design them into this? Mm -hmm. would not, the grant would not cover the cost of a generator, but it, you know, would that allow us to design that into the whole piece of, of this? So that's, um, that's where we're going. It's, uh, mm -hmm. It's um, been very difficult to identify exactly what to apply for um, and to get the information. But and I'm going on vacation two weeks before the grants due, so <laughs> so I have two weeks less than anybody else. <laughs> okay, any questions on those two? Those are two status yeah. reports. In that case, um, leading up to the funds for from the Energy and Sustainability Revolving Fund. I would like to get commission to approve spending up to ten thousand uh, dollars in support of the um, uh, looking in, in support of preparing to apply for an implementation grant for the well of the sustainability fund, uh, the, the, the resiliency fund, and up to ten thousand um, uh, dollars to spend towards the outreach and mobilization if needed, and that's really if needed, but just to you know, kind of set that money aside in your market that we can use it for for that if we if we need to spend that much money for the outreach and mobilization. Now was that two chunks of $10,000? Yeah. Or? Okay. Yeah. Uh, 61, 61,000. And I may have missed the boat. The SREX momentarily went up to around 280, 285 in May. Uh, yeah, and we should have sold now, kind of thing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So um, I'm not sure if they'll go back out. I think the sells the, the city's I do. Oh, you do. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I could put them into uh, the commission. Actually, has kind of suggested I. Hcock. I don't think Hcock sold theirs yeah, for this either. That? Right. I mean, maybe we do want to have someone else manage our S racks. That, that might be. Well, I don't know if ours well, can get sold by the. Right. I'm not sure if anybody else I know I trust that would do better than me. <laughs> then you should hold on to that. You know, just because yeah, just because you didn't operate as a day trader, you know, right. with a trigger finger. Mm -hmm. So what is it down to? Under two hundred? I don't. I don't know off the most. No, I don't know off the most. Is one eighty five the base? Okay. So 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 uh, so Wayne Wayne moved Wayne moved the uh, the motion. Second. Second. Any other discussion? Uh, all in favor? Aye. 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 Okay, no opposed, no abstentions. Wonderful, thank you. Um, all right, uh, next item is a community efficiency working group. It actually is kind of building off of this. Uh, and I've talked to Aiden, I don't know if Aiden you want to take this at point, but I, I was thinking that it might not be a bad idea to set up, to actually get a working group starting to meet on this, um, even before we get the grant, um, just to kind of put up a little land. I'm not talking about a monthly meeting or anything, but just to you know, kind of meet and say, how do we want to move forward with this grant money coming in and stuff like that? Aiden, you want to take it from there? Do you, do you agree with me on that? Yeah, I think it would be great to get a handful of people to talk about, the, just to, to gain awareness of what the program opportunities are, the funding opportunities are, what programs are available, and, um, and then 
reading what Chris writes up, how that might apply to brainstorm good ideas for developing something. And, um, and also bringing in a few key folks from the community to help, once we get to that, to that point, help really inform you designing something. Um, but I'm big into thinking holistically into the implementation of program design, not just how do you do a survey? You know, that's great. How to do a survey, great to know what questions to ask, but what is it feeding to? And that's what um, I think this group should start thinking of the beginning to the end. Not knowing where we get funny people from or other professional assistance. But uh, it'd be great. So, the focus on community uh, based energy efficiency. So, looking at houses, uh, single multi family houses, probably following the, the lead and structure of the utility programs, so one to four family houses, um, looking at data, looking at public records, um, but start to meet, um, to just wrap, I guess, start with what Chris developed as a, as a starting point. Great. So um, I know a few of you have mentioned you are interested. Already, I think Christina was one of them. Also, she's not here today. No, she's in the state. Where is it? Oklahoma. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but Mary, you mentioned yeah, you'd be interested. I, I, I'd be interested. Mm -hmm. Brian. Yeah. Basically, the community members of this community commission. I yeah. don't know. Yeah, how, how is that? I mean, as a working group of a commission, One, can we two, have? Three, four. Yeah, I think we talked about that. I mean, I, I suppose one way to handle it, I, I don't know an official way to handle it, but I mean, I, I can think of, there might be an easier way to handle it, but I can think of one way to handle it would be to ask anybody else we want to join the working group. And what I was picturing eventually was there would be a an advisory group that would not be the Energy Commission. You know, that would be an outside advisory group that would probably have this working group as a piece of it. So they would, but if we wanted to have the working group have a few mem members more, mm -hmm. if they could apply to be on the commission as a, um, well, what's the term? Associate. Yeah. Associate. Yeah. associate yeah. member. You know, non-voting associate member. Because the commission can have as many as they want, mm -hmm. and it's for this very reason, so that we have the expertise mm -hmm. when we need it. I can't remember what the structure is, but I know when we were setting up the ad hoc committee on stormwater, we ran into a lot of kind of bureaucratic stuff. I think we need to check um, to find out what the actual legality is of whether we could do that. Otherwise, you may have to go through a whole process of having appointments made to that, and we tried to avoid that piece, I believe. So but just make sure we check on what, how you do this legally. Um, and things have changed in the last few years. It used to be easier to just set up an ad hoc group. Um, By so an ad hoc group, you, you mean a subgroup, like a, a working group of the yeah. commission? Mm -hmm. okay. Yeah, so I, I would just suggest yeah. talking to, um, yeah. uh, I guess it would be Alan, I guess it would be our city solicitor. I think he might know that. Was it a certain number of us? Meet outside Jesse of Adams room? might also. He seems to know we have to post it as a... No, well, the, you definitely were going to have to post it. But in terms of official membership on that committee, I would just make sure you set it up in a way that's uh, however it's supposed to be set up. Do you have any idea? I just remember we be okay. There was a we were going to set up the a similar ad hoc, hoc community advisory committee for the stormwater stormwater task force. And I thought, oh, this would be simple. We just ask volunteers and get. And it it turned it was simple. I just did it the wrong way. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> okay. Uh, well, and I could work. Uh, I could. I could work on finding out what that is. Uh, yeah, it'd be great would be. to get other folks to be able to join in that conversation. Right. Uh, yes, I, I think so too. Right. I actually need to run off. Uh, not to scar your time. Yeah. I'll be more than willing to volunteer. Thank you. Okay. She's new, but she'll have to learn how to help you out. Right, right. Now that makes sense. Okay. Yeah, I do know at least, I don't know, was this under um, uh, the Board of Public Works that you were trying to do this? Yeah, the same thing under uh, Ed Lou Economic Development Committee. We have a sub uh, ad hoc group very similar that's specifically looking at Roundhouse. I just know it's easier than. Yeah. I, I would, thought we could just kind of do it and yeah. say it, and it's like. You I will definitely ask, but um, I know that on the ordinance that empowers this commission, yeah, 
I, I very this was something I asked for. Well, okay. Very specifically okay. to have an associate member position so that when we needed expert advice. But, but even associates so don't yeah. get go through yes. an appointments process. They have to go through an appointments process. So maybe, but there may be a way to avoid maybe that. Maybe a yes. Okay, okay. great. Okay. I'll try to avoid I'll try to avoid yeah. that. <laughs> Right. In terms of getting together, though, I think the end of July would be great. Okay. For summer's busy time, but we would we would definitely know by then. Yeah. Uh, and I I think we should just assume we're going to have a but it's not a competitive ground. Um, I'm on vacation for the first three weeks of July, mm -hmm. so it sounds like right after that. Yeah, the last week works great. Mm -hmm. How about others here? Brian and Mary? Yeah, so we're just looking at yeah, last week. Yeah, last week, July <coughs> so 28th. 28th on that. Actually, I'm over on the 30th. So. Yeah, I'm, I'm fairly open that week. I'm wide open. So, 28th? Monday? And could this be a, a daytime meeting, or does it, does it need to be a meeting? Anything is okay. Okay. Yeah, I'll, right. do, I'll do whatever. Yeah. Right. Oh, pick a time then. Something. Yeah. <laughs> uh, four o'clock. Um, that's, that's a good barbecue time too. <laughs> <laughs> Somewhere near Who's somebody's grill. <laughs> I'm, I'm not kidding actually. Right. <laughs> a beer. Yeah, a beer and a couple of burgers. That's perfect. We have a little patio. How many people? Do, how many people are you expecting? I'm telling members of the public. Mm. Mm. Free food? A lot of people are showing up. Don't eat the beer. 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 Okay, 4 o'clock on the 28th. Location to be determined. Yeah. Okay. Chris, if you're away this first two weeks, so we, we skip in July. Are we, yeah, are we oh. not meeting in July? Uh, well, yeah. we'll talk about that. Okay. Okay. It's, next, it's almost next on the agenda. Okay. Yeah. Um, All right. Uh, actually, next on the agenda is um, uh, ordinance to ban styrofoam. But I do have July and August meeting locations. But we can so we have just a few okay. minutes left. I'll only, I'll only take a couple minutes. Okay. okay. Um, just want to update you and also um, it, actually this is both a styrofoam. What we're going to be introducing, I think I mentioned this last <coughs> week, and we're working on Councilor Adams and I, is a the same band they did in Brookline, which is a styrofoam band and combined with a single-use plastic bag, and which is actually much more potent as kind of the timing of that article that I think Bill Dwight sent to everyone that was in the Boston Globe, then it was in on Science Friday and NPR. They ran another little piece basically saying, are all these bands on styrofoam really environmentally that crucial? And when you look at it, it's kind of like, yeah, it's kind of better to have kind of plastic or paper, but unless that those materials that are replacing the styrofoam, styrofoam are compostable, it's in terms of climate change issues, it's almost, you know, worse to do that. So this and the, the issue that there is no argument about is single use plastic bags. Um, of which um, I had spoken a few weeks ago to Gary at State Street and um, he said to me, yeah, we stopped it doing this years ago. I said, how many do you use in a year? He said, a quarter of a million. I said, how many would you guess plastic, single-use plastic bags are used in the town of Northampton at Stop and Shop, um, State Street, mm -hmm. Big Y? And he said, I would guess 12 to 15 million. <laughs> and you get a figure like that, you start to go, whoa. It's just an amazing figure. And what we're doing is we're kind of putting together what are the five or six key destructive environmental things on plastic bags. In the Brookline model, what we're really looking at is compostability. And so that, yeah, you can use single-use plastic bags that are definitely more expensive. They, it, it, usually in communities that have done this, they phase out the use of the bag. But anything you use has to be marine biodegradable, so they're not ending up in the ocean where they're incredibly destructive. But also this then would apply on the styrofoam stuff. When I talked to the folks at Amherst, they said the thing we wish we had done was to not only say you can't use styrofoam, but give direction in terms of what you should be using, which is something that's compostable. Mm -hmm. So, and some interesting things of the uh, Kids at the Youth Commission, who were really sparking them behind this, did a little survey. It's not particularly scientific, but I thought it was well done. 
they went to 22 restaurants in downtown, 10 restaurants in Florence, and asked the owners various questions. First of all, do you use styrofoam? In downtown, of the 22 they went to, 16 don't use styrofoam at all. And of those, only two offered any objections if we went through this. The other two were saying, well, we were planning on switching anyway. We think it's a good idea. And basically, they got back, if everybody's doing it, we'd be willing to do it. The only two places, and this was the same thing they found in Amherst, Dunkin' Donuts seems to be on the styrofoam piece, a main objector. But it's beginning, my understanding is, and the research is, the, the corporate headquarters is starting to see this happen at a number of cities throughout the country. The writing is on the wall. There are two or three state legislatures looking at this. And so they're now in their catalog of where people can order. They're going to begin to show you can get other material to do this. But Dunkin' Donuts will probably be, a, once again, arguing against it. But now that Amherst has done it, those folks are going to have to get their stuff. But somewhere in the others tend to be the Asian restaurants in terms of takeout. Mm. That's on the styrofoam piece. The other piece is in terms of the single-use plastic bag, it turns out that five years ago, Suzanne Beck and I met, because we're trying to get the chamber support and help on this. Um, and just let me tell you, the way we're presenting it, tomorrow, we could pass this in the city council. Yeah, I need to be, I'm not usually quite so <laughs> blunt with my statement, maybe I'm wrong, but I think we could probably get seven or eight votes to pass this. What we're trying to do is bring people along and educate people on why we're doing this, because then you have the enforceability piece, which is going to take communities involvement. But we also want to make it so that the businesses have some say as we write this ordinance, and there's you know some wiggle room with this. The, so when they met five years ago, Stop and Shop was the most open to the idea, because if you remember, they were doing a whole thing of paying for a while. It was a nickel a bag. Um, if you brought your own bag. So Stop and Shop is more as a, on a corporate level, is interested, and it's to their benefit, and to all the store's benefits, if people really begin to bring their own bag, not even using the paper bag or compostable bag. And actually, Suzanne said that we as a community, and I didn't know this, you guys might, that we have the highest level of that bring your own bag of any city in, in uh, Massachusetts. That may be another one of the five star things. Can I just Stop and Shop? What's that? The stop and shop specifically, right? No, used throughout the city oh, in really various places, places, so the co-op and other places, that people are just more used to doing that in Northampton. We're going to, and five years ago, and again, I think it's a little like what Lily said, there wasn't quite the urgency on some of these environmental issues. I think we've kind of hit this point where people are saying, hey, we got to do something, and there's a frustration level. Um, and they had a meeting, and there wasn't, there was, much more opposition to that single-use bag thing. Um, again, we're going to be presenting it. But so we're going to have a meeting, the same kind of meeting with retailers. And these, again, the ordinance applies to commercial outfits over 2,200 square feet. We could go a little larger, a little smaller, that are using that um, are using these single-use bags. Mm -hmm. And those are mostly we're talking about the grocery stores doing this. And so we're going to have a meeting with retailers that applies to probably in the fall. We're going to present it as, look at, we're going to basically, we're going to pass this thing, but we want to come to you and ask you, what are the kind of things that you'd like to see change in this ordinance to make it easier for you? It could be an extension of the number of years, it could be, you know, phasing in the marine compostability, it could be how do we have a maybe a carrot and stick program, the carrot theme, maybe we have some program that's, you know, you get acknowledged for being a, a supporter of the environment, something like that. Um, so I just wanted to bring that here. We're going to need some help in various ways in terms of educating the public. And one of the things we're looking for is endorsement. As we're ready to bring this forward, we'll be coming to say, would this committee endorse this ordinance? The other thing we could use just individually is people beginning now. Again, we're not going to bring this until Earth Day of next year, which is a Wednesday. We're going to have a special session to pass so the, maybe two ordinances, and there may be another one to pass all three on Earth Day. Until that time, but starting now, we'd love to see some letters begin to go in to the paper talking about things like, you know, what styrofoam does in the landfill, single-use plastic bags. Um, so I think that's... A well, are you aware that there. there's a biodegradable single-use plastic bag out there? Yeah, and we're looking at whether that is, that, that probably is the one that's marine biodegradable. There are some that are biodegradable, but they end up actually in the oceans and in waterways as tiny little pieces of plastic. Uh, 
And then there are some that completely biodegrade. And that common little plastic is bigger to the styrofoam. Like they yeah. have to small. Yeah, the styrofoam too. The styrofoam also takes yeah. up a lot of and at one point I <coughs> I bought compostable compostable plastic bags to put my compost in. So I could just pull it out of the container yeah. and throw it in the compost pile. <laughs> they sat in that compost pile for a long time. Yeah. <laughs> it didn't go away. Right. <laughs> well, they I mean, some of those streams right. too that are compostable. Two years later, I'm digging up and I still find the uh, right, right, the yogurt place <laughs> potato stone. Mm -hmm. well, we we use it. Yeah. Are the schools use styrofoam? Yeah, um, it they are. They're. I think the high school or JFK was still using styrofoam, mm -hmm. but we've been talking with them to at least get the schools. To not be using them again. This is applying to commercial establishments, but certainly the city should not be using it as a model. For that. So <laughs> yeah, we're going to do that. I, a comment on Jackson Street. I have on my kitchen floor uh, uh, bags, three bags of stainless steel forks, knives, and spoons that were collected as donations by the Green Team at Jackson Street School in order to, you know, make a play for. You know, fix your dishwasher or get your dishwasher going. Yeah. Use the you know stainless steel you know flatware mm -hmm. instead of plastic and the styrofoam. But there's there's resistance by a certain uh, person. So yeah. it's impossible. Well, biodegradable stuff is so much more expensive. Than yeah, there's, not, I mean, there's, stuff. We, there's so much. There's plenty of flatware out there that can be used. Mm -hmm. Doesn't have to match. Mm -hmm. you know. Yeah. We pulled out all the really cheap aluminum stuff. You know, it's very <laughs> nice. You know. Kids all counted it up. The numbers are on the bags. We'll see. So that's moving forward. Okay. That's okay. So last item. Um, so July and August, as I mentioned in the past, I, I, I brought here. Uh, we can't meet here uh, because city council changes their um, uh, the schedules, and so this uh, council chamber is not available. Um, and oh, we don't need to. Yes, you do. So we, oh, here. what it is is NCTV grabs the room, okay. and they really don't want anybody else in here when they're preparing. Okay, right. That's that's what it is, right? Um, so uh, uh, last time I brought this up, uh, I asked, do we shift locations or do we shift times? And the commission said uh, shift locations. Uh, so if we're going to stick with that, then the one place I can find the meat is the DPW. I thought you were away on vacation. I'll, I'll okay. get to that in a minute. Yeah, we've, I've, I've been away on vacations before. You don't need me here. I, I'm a member, but I'm not a voting member. <laughs> um, so, uh, uh, but that's up, to the that's up to the commission. Although I do believe the ordinance says we're supposed to meet once in, uh, uh, at, a, at, a, at a minimum once a month. Summertime. Yeah. <laughs> that's all I'm going to I'm away okay. July. Uh, You'll be away. All right, well, maybe we should. Is, do you guys want to, you know, vote whether or not we're just going to not meet in July? Is that? Is there any reason I can think? I can't think of anything. I'll be gone. I don't care. <laughs> <laughs> I move that we don't meet in July. Yeah, that's good to have a space if things are back. Yeah. New energy. Yeah. Right. Okay. I heard a motion. Except we talked about meeting the end of July, so we would still be in the work group. The, uh, yeah. the work group would, right? Yeah. So we're meeting all the parties. There we go. Right. Um, I don't know if that needs to be a formal motion or not, but yeah. I, I, I'm hearing an informal, no, no meeting in July. Okay. Um, so then August, uh, we could uh, we could meet at the DPW meeting room. Uh, if, and, and I know there are people who like to stay local. They want to stay a little bit more right downtown. Sorry, Ned. <laughs> it's fine. <laughs> it's the only one I could find it would be Forbes Library, but we would have to move our meeting time. Um, August 12th, or 14th. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, so. Um, what about the community room with the police station or the senior center, the back conference room? Community room in the police station. Ooh. That's a new one. That nice it's open to the public. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Uh, you know, and no one, no site pointed that. Is that open for anybody to have meetings at? Community room. You know, we should have that on. I mean, I went on, we, we now have an online reservation system for the city. I went on and I found out that you could set up a meeting in room 10 of City Hall. I said, room 10, City Hall? <laughs> no, it's not my office. It's Wayne's <laughs> office. <laughs> it is. <laughs> right. I had to ask around. I said, what's room 10? 
And then they said it would weigh its office. I said, oh, okay. <laughs> but if the community room is available at the police station, that should be on there, too. Uh, okay, I can could, I could look at that. So it sounds like... I'm away, so I'm not sure you're not going to have a problem for In July or August? August. As far as I know, you're the only person who said you're going to be away in August. I'll be here. Anybody else? I'll be here. Okay, so that, that should be okay. Okay, so what I will do is... Um, it sounds like I will see if I can get the police uh, conference room, and that would be a nice place to meet. Very nice place. Yeah. And if I can't, then we will meet at the GW. Um, just yeah. let me know in advance so I can reserve the room. There we go. <laughs> Backup plan. Yeah. Call me the pencil that in now? No, I put it online. It's, it's on, it's your, the DPW meeting room is online as well. You didn't know that. <laughs> no, because I don't yeah, think you can check that. You look under, go under admin, and then click on facilities, okay. and then click on meeting rooms. I'll it'll have to have, check another it, thing. It'll have, DPW, it'll have DPW conference room, and you can schedule a meeting there. And the DPW conference room is the one at the recycling center. Yeah. Oh, yeah, that building where that admin room is there. Only <laughs> until 4.30, correct? Um, I'm preparing all the staff leaves. <laughs> Uh, you know, I don't know what it says up there, but I mean, I think what you do is you you apply, you put you put in you put in for it, and then it has to be approved. But who's actually approved? The other ones are automatic. I have no idea. I have no idea, but it's up there. So, and you've offered it in the past, so I just okay. grabbed them just in case. Just have no, we don't have a lot of seats there. That's all. But we have enough for. This is enough for the commission and yeah. the small audience. Right. Yeah. Yeah. So I will see if I can get the police. Uh, that's, that's more downtown, and people would appreciate that. And there's heat, too. All right. Uh, <laughs> vote to adjourn. All in favor, second. Second, all in favor. Aye. You can vote.